know, it's almost like a puzzle that you have to decipher because there's a lot of different timelines going on. As you said, there's different versions of the characters in different moments. And, uh, you know, the first time through, I didn't get everything. I still enjoyed it, but I didn't understand every moment. Sitting through it a second time, I was able to recognize things and go, oh, yeah, that's what happened here. And that's what they're referring to there. I still don't think I got everything. I think I'd probably need to sit through it a third time or maybe a fourth time. I would probably still be noticing things that I didn't notice the first time or the second time. But I, I believe it's all there. I believe he's done a great job of putting it all together. And if you were able to pull it apart, you'd be able to see that, oh, yeah, all these parts do fit together. Yeah, it's interesting for a first time filmmaker, uh, say what you want about the script um, and the dialogue, but I think he did a great job for a first time filmmaker. He shot one for one, which can turn out to be an Ed Wood movie or a Doris Wishman movie, <laughs> but it turned out to be a pretty good movie. Um, I think the budget was around 10 grand, which again could end up, and there have been movies that cost this little that have been successful, just as successful even more successful and even less successful. So a few examples would be, um, I would guess that a Blair Witch, I don't know the exact budget, maybe in that range. Um, there's a paranormal activity that we already reviewed on this channel, I guess would be around that range if I had to guess. And I, I don't know what the budget is for something like the original Evil Dead or um, Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Who knows, maybe a lot more, maybe a little bit less, but I would think somewhere in the ballpark, all those are, are low budget movies. You know, a lot of them were even more successful than this, but I think with those and with this, it shows that you don't need a ton of money as long as you have an interesting idea and um, good execution, you can have a really good movie that can compete with movies that have giant budgets. Um, which again, which is one of my favorite lines in the film where he talks about, you know, NASA spending all that money to create this pen and they just did it with a pencil, kind of like how he did this movie. <laughs> it's like, you know, he, he did it with a pencil. He didn't need uh, some super expensive pen. And uh, I thought it was pretty interesting. There was one movie um, that cost around this amount of money that wasn't as successful. Um, and uh, it's a little movie called Mandingo Sex Addict <laughs> by yours truly. <laughs> Where uh -huh. I had about 10 grand and instead of, you know, uh, being creative with different things, I um, I spent it on a bunch of pretty women and, and did a erotic film and I bought a bunch of equipment that I didn't even end up using. But it shows you like, you know, 10 grand can go a lot of different ways and it, you can do a lot of different interesting things with it. So, Oh, for sure. And uh, this movie, I, I believe, uh, was a success at the Sundance Film Festival. Is that right? And uh, and then it got some sort of distribution. Uh, and I think it made over $500,000 in its initial release, which is really great if it only costs seven or $10,000 to make. That's a huge profit. But of course, mainstream Hollywood doesn't necessarily even consider that to be uh, real money. You know, um, somebody once said to me, uh, if you want to have a career in Hollywood, you're better off to direct a $100 million movie that loses money than a $1 million movie that makes money because they're more impressed by the fact that you made a $100 million movie, which I think is insane. You know, I think they should make more movies to cost $10,000 or $1 million. And, you know, if it only makes a million or $2 million, that's great, you know, but as soon as you make a $100 million, a $100 million movie, you know, you can't, it's almost impossible to make that money back. It's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. But, um, but it's interesting, though, this movie, like, I didn't know about it. I didn't hear about it uh, until you mentioned it uh, last week. So it hasn't sort of become like Blair Witch Project or, or something like that, where it was really kind of a mainstream phenomenon. It's uh, It did well. It made money and certainly got a lot of critical acclaim. But uh, I'm not sure why it hasn't reached a bigger audience, because it is a good movie. Um, and the director, it looks like he hasn't gone on to do very much since then. I think he's only made maybe one other movie as a, as a writer-director and maybe produced a third one. Um, do you know anything about that? No, so he hasn't gone on to do a lot, but you can say the same thing about the director who did Paranormal Activity, who didn't go on to do a lot. I mean, 
sometimes with a movie like this, um, it could even be with musicians. Sometimes you have one thing to say. You got one shot to say your story, blow your load. And um, see, I went there, blow your load, bring it back to my thing. <laughs> sex addict. See how I, I created my little loop there. I, that's I brought it that's all right. Together, just like that's primer. Not... <laughs> Not quite a time, time loop, but something. Yes, yes. yes. I, I got it. <laughs> uh, uh, so I think sometimes you have a story to tell. You have a story to tell and you tell your story and that's pretty much it. And some filmmakers, some musicians, some artists, they just retell that same story over and over again and with little variations of it. But sometimes you just have the one opportunity to tell your story and that's pretty much it. I think the same thing, like I said, with the Paranormal Materia director, he didn't go on to do a lot more. Um, and this gives you an opportunity, a spotlight when your one story hits really big. Um, and sometimes you don't have any more stories to tell in you, you know, or the variations of your story aren't different enough or don't hit quite the same way. And that's kind of it for you. It doesn't mean you're bad. It just means that, you know, you were passionate about something people saw that passion they connected with it and and that's pretty much it but you have a ton of filmmakers that essentially you look at their filmography and it's all variations of the same movie they stay in the same genre it's just you know it's this it's a different psycho killer but it's still some killer killing a bunch of people or you know quentin tarantino being an example a lot of his movies are variations of the same thing not, none of the characters talk the way normal people talk. They talk the way Quentin Tarantino talks. If you see an interview, he's talking about all these old movies and he's talking all fast and rapid, like he just did like a yeah, eight ball of Coke. And then you see the, the characters in his films, you know, they're either like young models or big movie stars and they all talk like him. And it's like, you know, I don't believe any of you have watched any of those movies that you're talking about. I believe the director who gave you those lines did. Um, but sometimes the variations of your story are good enough to keep a career going or filmography going, but sometimes it's not, you know? Um, I don't view it as a bad thing that he hasn't done a ton of stuff. I view it as a good thing that he, his one story that he had to tell like really transcended and, you know, like you said, made a lot more than what it costs and, and build a name for himself. Yeah, well, that's true. Um, you know, some people only do have one thing to say and some people are comfortable with that. Um, I know he has gone on to work on some other things. And, uh, and like I said, I think he had at least one other film come out. So hopefully he will do some more. And uh, I, I don't know if his second film was a lot like this or if it was really different. I don't know. I haven't seen it. But um, anyway, I heard it was as yeah. dense as this, like as tough to follow <laughs> as this, but I haven't watched it or, or did any other follow up besides hearing a little bit about it. Yeah, well, that would make sense, I guess. Uh, that could be his personal style. Dense, not dumbing it down, mm -hmm. keeping in all the jargon. Yeah. And again, maybe he did something just as dense, but the time travel thing is more interesting to people than whatever the other dense movie he did, you know, they can look at, man, this is dense and interesting, or this is just dense and I give up, you know, uh, yeah. I'll pass. So, um, but again, for a first time filmmaker, I mean, he, he, he shot one for one, did a great job with that. Interesting that he decided, Hey, I'm going to, I'm going to stick with this dialogue and you either follow it or you don't. And if you like, you find it interesting and I hook you, you're going to watch it like three, four, multiple times, you know, you're going to keep watching it. And, I think that's what he did. He he has a movie that didn't appeal to a lot of people, but the people it did appeal to are probably willing to watch it multiple times, own copies of it. And he got like a little cult following with this movie. And that's the reason I heard of it because of the cult following. Um, I thought another thing interesting for a first time filmmaker is it was a good um, shot composition in this. There were some interesting shots. I was like, man, this is a pretty creative shot for someone who's never done this before. I thought the shot list was really good. The only thing I could knock on it that was a little amateurish was there's a, a lot of out of focus shots that I think weren't intentionally out of focus. But as far as the look of the film, leaving out the out of focus shots, the shot composition I thought was pretty creative considering the limited locations and things like that. He found a creative way to shoot it. Considering most of the movies was just a couple of, you know, late 20s early 30s guys in suits just having conversations yeah 
no, I thought it looked great. I didn't think it looked like a no budget film. I thought it looked good. It looked like it needed to look, you know, guys working in a garage, you know, low budget inventors or whatever you want to call them working on stuff in a garage. It all looked totally appropriate sitting in a hotel room, you know, it, it was low budget, but it didn't look painfully low budget. It just looked like it should. Another film that we reviewed that is an all time classic, one of my favorite films of all time, uh, All About Eve, an incredible movie. But I would say this looked better than All About Eve because they just <laughs> went with very standard shots, you know, a very boring looking film. So sometimes it shows that like budget has nothing to do with creativity. Uh, again, not a knock on All About Eve. It's just bringing it up to, you know, praise this one. You know, sometimes, you know, people, they don't view value in certain aspects of filmmaking. It's just like, all right, I'm just going to tell my story. I won't get wrapped up in trying to make it look creative. I don't think this movie got too wrapped up in trying to be creative, but it made it visually interesting because again, it's just people having conversations. You can say, you can say sci-fi this, you can say interesting that, you can say multiples and doubles and all this other stuff, but there was no budget there. The creativity was all in the dialogue. You know, it's, it's not like we saw them on screen at the same time, any of the doubles. We just saw them looking from a distance. There wasn't anything as far as like um, visual effects that made you say, oh my gosh, there are three of them. Look, there are three of them. No, they say there are multiple of them. And we just buy it because we get wrapped up in the story and the dialogue and following what's going along. But visually, it doesn't surely show you anything besides they have a conversation here, they have a conversation there. They're sitting in a hotel, they're sitting in a living room. Uh, again, the shots weren't like, you know, something you'd see in a Orson Welles movie, but it did distract you enough that you didn't just say, hey, this is just a bunch of people sitting around talking.